it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me they don't make people that that big the way it moved uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. John Pellegrino, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking to Jonathan. And Jonathan is originally from Alaska. Um, and him and his sister and a friend of his went out camping. And it's a fascinating account because they thought they were camping in an old hunter's camp. And it was kind of a boneyard. And if you've listened to the show for a while, uh, there's accounts of people coming across these boneyards out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it was a very terrifying night. They were chased off the mountain. And then we're going to be talking to Fox. And Fox comes to us from Florida. Uh, and Fox actually had a very strange encounter when he was a young man uh, out partying with his friends in the woods. And he has a cool company, Wild Wild Pests. If you're in Florida, check it out. He does uh, animal control. We'll come out and get rid of uh, different you know, pest animals. And uh, So if you're out there in Florida, definitely check it out. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's actually jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Jonathan to the show. Jonathan, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me on, Wes. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And uh, I was fascinated when you sent me your email uh, with uh, the encounters there in Alaska. Uh, if you would, I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away. Kind of tell us what you were doing and and walk us into that that very first encounter. So uh, my very first encounter, I was uh, around seven years old. And uh, we were living out in this town in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. You know, so it's equal distance from Anchorage and from Fairbanks. It's 400 miles from Anchorage, 400 miles from Fairbanks, pretty much. So we're we're in this little village, town, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so we didn't have any power or running water. So to get water, we would have to load jugs into the car and uh, drive down to the river, load up the jugs, load up the everything full of water, and then haul it back to the house. And uh, we were pulling down to this little pull-off. Uh, so you drive down onto the pull-off, and then you uh, get out and you can lean down into the river that flows under the road. So we got down under there and uh, we, we filled up the jugs and we put them in the back seat and I was just small. So I was sitting in the back of the car, making sure they didn't tip over. And uh, as we were pulling out on the other side of the road, you know, the river still th flows through the road. So on the other side, uh, I was looking out the back window 
and I saw a big, hairy, brown and gray dude, pretty much, as that's what I told my parents, uh, stand up out of the ditch. And he was just kind of watching us. But he he was only about 20 feet away from us the entire time. And we had no idea he was there. Can you describe what you saw? Uh, so, well, I can't really get a height because I was a kid. I'm not, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, but he was, you know, he was very big. He was, he looked like the size of a standard bear because I had seen bears when I was that age. So, yeah, standard bear size. So probably, you know, eight feet tall, a couple hundred pounds. And uh, he was brown and very gray and gray in spots. Like he was uh, kind of looked like he was dirty snow color. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he looked like he was dirty snow color and he uh, had very long, shaggy hair. One question I want to ask you is um, when did his expression change? I mean, I, I'm assuming he's looking right at you because he you said he stands up out of the ditch as you guys are driving by. Uh, yeah. So when he stood up out of the ditch, uh, the expression on his face was kind of it looked kind of angry. He had a more human face it wasn't like recognizably human but it was more human than like you would see it on a gorilla or a chimpanzee it was like part way in between and you could definitely tell he had facial expressions at that moment do you start telling your banging on the window for your parents or do you wait till uh, the car stops and and what was the conversation with your parents like uh, so I uh, just pretty much was like, hey, mom, dad, and there's a big hairy dude. And they're like, OK, yeah, whatever. And never talked about it again. Yeah, it's terrifying. As you and I were talking uh, before we went on an air, I was telling you about Brenda Harris. Um, I remember she came on. Um, she's from the tribe down there in, uh, I believe, New Mexico. And she was telling the story one time about one of these creatures trying to grab a kid out of the back of a truck as they were going down the road. You know, that it, it's interesting behavior, too, if you really think about it. You know, any other animal on the planet probably would have taken off. Uh, you've yeah. lived in Alaska. You know animals. It probably would have taken off just hearing you guys go by or whatever. Well, so I think it, the behavior is kind of more like a bear because a bear won't leave. Bears, the, the big grizzly bears down there aren't scared of you, really. Yeah, you so might be right. I, I, we just yeah. have black bears. I can only speak to really black bears here in oh, Washington okay. State. Well. So if a if a grizzly bear thinks that he can get some easy food, he's gonna he's gonna try. And uh, so yeah, we we have a school down there, and uh, sometimes we'll have grizzly bears just kind of like sit and watch the kids on the playground. That's crazy, man. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy yeah. uh, when you think about it. Uh, do, yeah. Do and, people get attacked down in Alaska? I almost said down there. I mean, up there in Alaska. Do <laughs> is there a lot of people who who are attacked by him? I mean, if they're coming in and watching kids like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're in the wrong spot, the wrong time, it's going to happen. Yeah. Bears are not cuddly. Yeah, they will no. eat you. Yeah. No doubt. Well, tell me about your second encounter. Now, the second encounter, did it still happen in Alaska? Yeah. So we were actually, uh, so the the little village town I live in, uh, there's about maybe 100 people. And then, so the place we went to was another, you know, 50 miles in the wrong direction. So down this, like, pretty much dirt road, down 40 miles, then you'll find a little pull off, and then you just climb up this mountain for another three, four hours. So you, you get up on top of this mountain, you can look around, and there's nobody for, like, hundreds of miles. There's nothing. It's really pretty. It's really cool. But you're also, there's nothing there. So we, me and my sister decided to take my, our friend Matt. Uh, he's, you know, a kid from the city. And we were like, all right, well, let's just take him camping. So me and my sister take uh, her, her dog, a uh, couple guns and, uh, you know, food, pots, pans, all that, you know, just normal camping stuff. And so we just head out there. It's the middle of nowhere. There's nobody around for hundreds of miles. There's nothing. And uh, so we were getting up and we're going. And uh, so we find this little like 
uh, I don't know what you guys would call it anywhere else, but like a little hunter's camp. There's like moose bones and antlers and all sorts of just skeletons. So we figured it was a hunter's camp. So we just kind of said, all right, well, we'll just sleep here for the night. And then, uh, so we lit a fire, put up our tents and, uh, just sat there and, uh, no, it was very uneventful until we went to bed. Uh, and it was me and Matt in one tent and my sister and her dog in another tent. And, uh, we were laying down and all of a sudden I hear a branch crate break, just snap. And I'm like, Hey, Aaron, did you hear that? And she's like, uh, no, you're just hearing things go back to sleep. And then all of a sudden we heard snap, 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 snap. And uh, she got out of her tent and I got out of my tent and she was like, okay, I heard that. So we, we deal with animals all the time, you know, bears, wolves, pretty much everything. Like the occasional mountain lion. Sometimes they'll come down from Canada or come over from Canada. And uh, so we just built the fire and we were like, okay, whatever, it's going to go away. Uh, and then it starts circling the camp. And we're like, okay, it's not going away. That's weird. So my sister, she's like, all right, well, fire off a couple rounds in the uh, SKS. So I fire off a couple rounds, boom, boom. That normally, you, no matter what it is, it's going to run. It's it's gone. Everything runs. And uh, so it dies down for about a good five minutes. And then uh, we go back to go to bed, and then it starts up again. We start hearing things circling the camp but now instead of one there's multiple different ones and uh you can hear them and it's very distinct when uh something runs on two feet uh, and uh at first we weren't really paying attention for that but when it was more than one you know you can't help but notice so they're circling the camp and you can hear them breaking s- sticks and stuff like that but they're not making any vocalizations uh, so when like a wolf is hunting something, it'll howl to the other wolves to let it know what it's doing. And where bears are very distinct because they can't, they always have this like really heavy breathing. And so we weren't hearing anything at all. And, and it sounded like it was running on two legs. So we're like, okay, that's really weird. So my sister's like, all right, pop off a couple more rounds in the general direction and of everything circling the camp. So I'm like, all right, so pop off like 10 rounds, bam, 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 bam. And it doesn't stop this time. Nothing stops. Instead of stopping, uh, you can t- hear it when one comes into the tam- camp and gets real close in circles. And uh, so we can't see anything outside of the firelight because it's it's pitch black. There's If you don't have a flashlight or a fire, you're not seeing anything. So it's you can hear them coming into the camp. So I'm thinking that uh, they're coming in for the dog or for Matt. And um, so we go into Aaron's tent and Lucius, her, he's a big old uh, American bulldog, red nose pit. And he's pretty much just peed all over himself, whimpering, crying. He won't come out of the tent. And then Matt gets out and says something touched his tent. He said something had ran its hand along the tent and run off. So we're like, all right, guys, get out of the tent. Let's go sit by the fire. And we go over to get our food out of the tree because uh, we always hang our food at least 100 feet away from the camp and always up in a tree. We go to get our food out of the tree, and then we look back, and you can see shadows running in the fire, really big shadows. So we're like, oh, okay, well, I know that if an animal wants you gone, you should probably just leave instead of trying to stand your ground so we're like okay no we're done and uh we gather up all of our stuff pack up all our tent uh the dog still refuses to walk he he will not move he's just he just is in a little ball whimpering so i take him up and i'm carrying him down the mountain uh my sister has uh a flashlight and a gun and matt has uh I think he has the SKS and a hit the backpack with pots, pans and food in it. And so we're going down the mountain and it's my sister. She's up front. I'm in the middle with the dog because we're still thinking, you know, this is an animal that wants the dog. And then Matt's in the back with a bag and the gun. 
And so we decided we started walking down the mountain and uh, we can still hear them circling. Like, so the, uh, the trail is a dirt trail. So you can hear when it's like a slapping sound when uh, kind of a, it's like a, if you run through the dirt trail with bare feet, do you know that sound? Kind of like running on pavement that, that slap slap. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So you could hear it when things would, run across the trail so we get about part way down and then matt goes i i can't go anymore and he sets his pack down on the ground real hard like so this trail is only about four feet wide so he sets his backpack on the edge of the trail and it makes a loud clank and then something about three feet away from him in the woods just takes off running and we, so everything else was making noise but this thing was sneaking up and we had no clue it was there. And uh, so we make it all the way back down the mountain, and we can still hear them circling us all the way down. And we get to the trailhead, and we get out on this little pullout where the car is. And we all jump in the car, and you can see them kind of running back and forth in the tree line. And then we just took off. Yeah, that's a crazy encounter, man. That's terrifying, especially trying to carry a pit, you know, what's that pit, 80 to 90 pounds, trying to carry that thing down down the mountain. And they're <laughs> uh-huh. big babies. I know they yeah. have a bad rap, but they really are big babies. But, you know, for it to react that way, you always hear of dogs reacting a lot like that when these things are around. They want nothing to do with these creatures. That's the weird thing, though, is because he's been around bears, he's been around wolves, he chases moose, you know, he does care, chases caribou, caribou are the stupidest animal on the planet, but he, he'll chase every anything, but for some reason, he was just so terrified peeing all over himself. That's insane. Did you know what it was? I mean, did you kind of have an idea of what it was, or was it just confusion all the way down? So, I think I know what it was. I think, I know... I think I know it was a Bigfoot just by the, because when animals run, they don't make that sound. They don't, you know, the, the like you, you were talking about the bare pay, feet on pavement. Animals aren't going to make that sound. That's a bare foot. I meant at the time, did you know what was going on or was it just kind of confusion? I know looking back, it's very common behavior to what they tend to do. Stay out of the firelight, circle you, <laughs> kind of harass you to get you to leave. Um, I would imagine, though, at the time, it was confusion. It had to have been. Yeah, no, I had no idea what it was at the time. This hunting camp that you went into, do you think it was a hunting camp, or do you think they were, these things were eating there? You'd mentioned there was bones everywhere. Yeah, so now looking back, uh, hunters don't leave antlers. So it was definitely not a hunting camp. I think it was a kill camp. <laughs> That's terrifying, man. I, I laugh, but I, it, you know, it's terrifying because you, you know, I can see why you would look around and go, "Oh, this is a hunting camp." When you first said that, I thought, "Oh, that's weird." A lot of times, hunters won't leave bones and things in their camp because yeah. it's it's bad for business. You'll have predators come in, you know. So a lot of times, hunters won't do that. Um, that does make me wonder if you were like in a little. Because, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who've come across uh, these bone piles and they'll walk in to an uh, enclosed area or whatever and they'll see just piles and piles of bones where something's been sitting and eating. And that's kind of what it sounds like you guys set up camp in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it definitely was. We've been out there all our lives. Uh, we've had weird experiences, but nothing on that magnitude. I think we, I think you did the right thing by leaving and I would have done the same thing you did. I would have fired off a couple of rounds, you know, in the air or cause you're right. Most animals will run off. It is fascinating though. The second time you did it, it wasn't one, it was several of them and they yeah. never, they never stopped with the harassment type behavior. You know what I mean? The territorial type. Yeah. Behavior. I think he, the first one ran off and pretty much was like, told him there was somebody in the camp. I think they're nocturnal. And so they had woke, woken up. He had gone out probably to look around, saw that we were in the camp, went back and got everybody. Could have been. Could have been. It was, a, it was a good 10 minutes that it was silent. Do you and your, your sister still talk about it or your buddy? Do you guys still talk about that night? So the second we got off the hill or the mountain, uh, I never talked to Matt again. He completely left. 
gone, never came back. <laughs> it scared the shit out of him. It, he, he, he never came back. Uh, but me and my sister talk about it a lot. We argue about it a lot. What do you guys argue about? Uh, so she is doesn't want to believe what it was. But we kind of debate about it. She want, doesn't want to believe it was a Bigfoot, but she kind of knows that it, there was really not much else it could have been. And I understand that. I understand when people are like that. You know, a lot of hunters are like that. They don't want yeah. to acknowledge, uh, even though they've had experiences, they'll tell you oh, it was a funny looking bear or, you know, other things that just make no sense. And, and yeah, exactly. I think it's a way people of protecting themselves. So I get where your sister's coming from. Yeah. Uh, what do you What do you think that these things are? What's your opinion, uh, Jonathan, as far as what this creature is? I would have to say that there are probably more than there's ha there has to be more than one different species because the, there's so many different reports. You get so many different types that there has to be more than one, and then. You got the whole entire woo side of it, which I, there has to be. There, there's probably something to that. I think there is something to that. So, you know, I have no idea. I keep my mind open to everything. Yeah, it's kind of a tough question to answer, you know, because they they display a lot of human like behavior. And you're right, there is different descriptions. Some people say it looked like a chimp. Some people say it looked very human-like. Yeah. And between the different appearances, you'll find different behaviors. Uh, yeah, well, plus you got, like, the white ones, which most of the time are described as, like, not earthly entities. And uh, then you got the really ugly ones that people describe as monsters. It's tough to pinpoint what this thing is, and I tend to agree with you. I think some of the weird stuff does go on, um, and what what's going on with all that, I don't know. Uh, well, so in, in Solano, sometimes uh, we will have things kind of like, it's kind of like playing games with us, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, So we would go down to the river, and uh, we, there, there's this little island across the way, like the river circles it and goes on. And uh, we would throw skip rocks over to the island through the river, just, you know, throw them over. And sometimes we would have rocks come back at us from the island. Yeah, I mean, they, there is playful behavior sometimes with these things. Um, I, I think most of the time uh, they don't really want to interact with you. Uh, yeah. They don't really, they'd rather just kind of watch and observe. And then the minute they realize they've been seen a lot of times they'll leave most of the time they'll leave uh, if they think they've been seen, but your encounter that night, I'm telling you, man, I, I think that is more of a dangerous uh, type situation. It's very similar. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Theodore Roosevelt's encounter. Uh, he yes, wrote, I have. It's very yeah. similar, you know, and, and those guys and the, the other guy started shooting at it. You know, he was going to kill it and it ended up killing him. Well, so uh, one thing I wanted to tell you about was, uh, so me and my buddy, went, we were out exploring because, we, we, you know, uh, sometimes we just like to go out and find new lakes. And we found this, like, abandoned camp. Like, it was an old houses. Uh, and you could tell they were old because they were built in the old style. So uh, in Alaska, we have this layer of permafrost under the ground. And uh, if you build on top of it, in the summer and winter, it'll shift and it'll shift your house. So a lot of the times they would dig under it and then that's where they would put their frame and stuff. And so that's how you can tell it's a older house. And there was like four or five of them circling this camp. And we were like, okay, this is weird because, you know, the camps had everything in it. It was just, they were completely abandoned. Like we don't, you can't tell what happened to these people. And then, uh, uh, a year later, we were cutting a road, and uh, this road's probably six miles away from this camp. And uh, we found a couple guns, uh, muzzle loader, fifty cows, uh, leaning up against tree this tree, like somebody had taken a break to go to the bathroom or something, and then never came back to get his gun. And we find weird things like that throughout the woods all the time, and people go missing a lot out there. 
the camp you're talking about. Uh, I think I read about that. That was a Native American camp, wasn't it? And like everyone vanished and they don't know why everyone vanished. Like they just up and left one day and no yeah. one knows why. Yeah, I thought about doing a show on that. It's a fascinating account. I can't remember that. What's the name? Do you remember the name of the camp up there? Oh, I have no idea. There's so oh, many. Gotcha. Yeah, there's one in particular, and it's a Native American. It was like a village. And oh. I'm talking modern times. And they left. Like everyone got up and just left. And they yeah. can't figure out why everyone just left. And within the Native American culture, there's a story about these creatures coming in and and harming people and killing people. And so that's why they left. Um, yeah. I'd love to see Alaska someday, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I, Hey, if you ever want to go up there, just let me know. Yeah. I, I would, take I you would up love on that. to be able to go back. I would love to be able to go back, but I cannot find anybody who is willing to go, actually go up, take, take the time out and go up there because it's not just like a little, you're not just going to go up on a two day trip. It's going right. to be a while. Yeah. And it's my, hard woods. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you're in, you're in real country out there. Um, yeah. I might take you up on that, man. I'd love to see Alaska someday and you'll have to let me know if you decide to go back. Yeah. Absolutely. Wes, I'm so honored to be on your show. Um, I've been a listener for years now and, um, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a little testimony at the beginning before I share my encounters. Sure. Sure. So, um, I happen to be, you know, a Christian. I accepted Lord Jesus Christ when I was a little boy. And, uh, although I'm full of flaws, I've tried to, you know, live the life. Um, that being said, uh, I was in a very major accident, um, back in 2016 and um, a woman hit my work truck going over 80 miles an hour is what they told me. And I had to be taken out with the jaws of life and everything. And um, I fared pretty well, but I I did um, break some, you know, some vertebrae and things like that. Um, and so a few months later, I actually had a, a brain aneurysm as a result to that accident because I had hit my, my head so hard and, um, I was literally a vegetable. Um, the neurologist told me later after I got well, thank the Lord. Um, he told me that I had the worst, um, brain aneurysm, aneurysm that you can have. He said that only 7% of people live through it. And, um, most people will end up not being able to talk or walk or have their motor skills again. So for quite some time, I was literally a vegetable um, laying up in a hospital bed. And because of my faith and my hard work ethic, I was able to come back and, um, you know, be able to do things again. Um, I'm in pain a lot, but uh, you know, I just try to every day do the best I can. I'm not on a bunch of medication or anything. I just try to, uh, stay busy and avoid the pain and whatnot. But anyways, um, a lot of the people that I went through rehabilitation with, and I went through rehabilitation, um, at, at a center and also on my own for years now, I'm constantly trying to, you know, get better and stronger. Um, anyway, so a lot of them, they can't talk, they can't walk, um, they, they can't do a lot of things and I feel really bad for those folks. So I'm just, uh, so grateful that, that I was one of the few that, that overcame a lot of that. And, um, even though it's hard to talk about, um, I, I really, um, <laughs> It, it's one of those things where I literally had to learn to talk again. I had to learn to walk again, use my motor skills again, um, and just be able to have, you know, um, life again, you know, to be able to, to, to have my life back again. And 
So when you go through those things, a lot of times it makes you really reflect back on your life and it makes you uh, so grateful for what you have. And so with that being said, Wes, um, I started listening to your show when I was laid up and I couldn't really do anything. And I can't even tell you how much it helped me. Um, it, it, it really helped me so much to um, hear all the different encounters and, and, and all the heartfelt emotions from people. And it touched me just as much hearing how much you cared about each and every one of them. I mean, it, it, the sincerity in your voice and, and the way you care about people. I mean, you're, you're touching so many lives and you certainly touched mine. And I'm so grateful for that. And I thank you. Yeah, man. I appreciate you saying that. That's very kind words and probably more deserve, more, um, not deserve them, you know, than what I actually deserve. But um, <laughs> I appreciate you, uh, you, you saying that. That's that's very, very kind of you. And and thank God you got through what you know with your aneurysm and everything else. Thank God you got through that. You know what I mean? Doctor's right. Not a lot of people get through that. So it's it's all you as far as getting through that. But thank you again for the kind words. Absolutely. So. Um... I'll go back to uh, when I was a little boy. I grew up in the country here in Florida, and um, we raised horses and cattle and crops. And, um, you know, we had a, a farm where we did that, plus we raised other livestock. But our farm butted up to thousands of acres, and it was really uninhabited. I mean, there were literally thousands of acres that no one lived on or anything. Um, some, some of it had cattle on it. Um, but for the most part there, it was just all wilderness. Since we raised horses, um, my, my grandfather from Spain back, back in the sixties and early seventies, um, he could bring horses from Spain. You can't do it anymore, but he could bring like the Andalusians from Spain, which is the oldest breed of horse. Um, and he could bring them and we would raise them and we would sell them and whatnot. And, and we also had other types of horses too, that he would bring in. So, uh, one time I, I was probably about seven years old we had one of our main horses that went missing. So we went looking for it, of course, you know, and we rode our other horses looking everywhere for it and search for it. And finally we were able to find it. And when we did, uh, this horse had been attacked by something Wes. it, it was like, the only way I know to describe it, it looked like a giant hand with claws had just attacked this horse from like the top of the ears all the way down to the, to the, you know, all the way down the neck to the Gaskins, which is, you know, the center part of the, the leg corner. And so it, it, um, uh, it really just, um, uh, terrified us, you know, and, so they were saying that it, you know, might have been a Florida panther or something, but there's no way that any big cat, even probably a lion or a tiger, could have done this kind of damage. I mean, th this horse was just ripped open, and it was it was spread out. I mean, you could clearly see where a giant hand with claws just ripped down this down this, you know, down this horse. And so we did everything we could to save it. And we had a veterinarian working on them and everything. And finally, uh, to our amazement, the horse ended up surviving. Um, so that, that was the beginning for me of really starting to research and look into, you know, all the wildlife uh, in Florida and 
um, really getting interested in, in, uh, animals. And, and while I was doing that, uh, I started learning about Sasquatch, you know, they call them the skunk ape down here, but I've always referred to them as Sasquatch. And I will tell you, and this is all, you know, document, I'm sure people could look it up and find out, uh, for themselves, but, I will tell you, I remember many times around that era when I was a boy hearing on the local news in our in our area of Florida where people would cite, they would call it Bigfoot, of course. They, they usually didn't even say the skunk ape, but they would say Bigfoot, where it would be on it would be on the radio that somebody cited Bigfoot, you know, at such and such place and. I remember one time my friends and I were camping and we literally heard that come over the radio and where they sighted them was only like maybe 10 miles from where we were. So, you know, we were of course pretty terrified that night. <laughs> we, we slept with our shotguns. <laughs> yeah. I would uh, imagine. I would imagine. And, you know, the Hortz incident, you know, we can't say it was Sasquatch because we didn't see it do it. But um, I've heard a lot of kills that way, you know, where hunters will come up to deers and they're, they appear to be uh, something with five fingers and fingernails, cut this thing open and ate the guts, you know, or uh, slashed the throat of a goat. And it looks like something with five fingers did it. So, I mean, that would draw my attention to, thank God the, the horse survived, but that would draw my attention because, you know, a feline makes no sense and a coyote makes no sense. All your normal predators really make no sense. A bear makes no sense. So I would see why, you know, you would, you would kind of look into it. Uh, but you had your own encounter, a very strange, terrifying night. Uh, when you were out with your friends, uh, if you wouldn't mind, tell us kind of what happened that night. Absolutely. And um, the horse uh, encounter real quick, um, to be honest with you, Wes, all I could think about was some monster. You know, it, even my grandfather, who was very familiar with the wilderness, he he really taught me a lot about the wilderness and animals and things. He was even mystified by it. He, he couldn't believe it, you know. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that you're absolutely right. That that was terrifying. And all I could remember is, you know, I would lay lay in bed at night thinking about monsters. <laughs> uh, so anyway, to my encounter, um, we were in high school, and uh, back then we would always you know, camp along, uh, the rivers and camp along, you know, the, 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 um, uh, places that were more desolate, you know, were way out of the way, you know, back in the wilderness and a buddy of mine, um, they owned a big ranch. And so we had like designated campsites on different, uh, land. And one of our good campsites was on his ranch, in the back of his ranch. So I estimated about there were anywhere between 14 to 18 of us all together that night. And we were doing like a weekend camp out. And so, you know, we would, the guys and the girls would get together and we would camp back there. And, you know, everybody knew everybody and, um, it was just a fun time for us, you know? So we had this one designated uh, campsite that was way back in the back of this ranch. And I would say it was probably about 400 yards from the main, the main home on the ranch. So we were back there and back behind our campsite, there was like an old railroad trestle and then there was like a creek back in there. And then it butted up to a bunch more land that was really thick. Well, just beyond our campsite was a clear cut hay field. And uh, on that hay field, there was like a, one of those flatbed trucks with the Texas style bale hay on it. And there were probably about four or five rolls of it on there that were left. 
so anyways, uh, we were camping and it was in November and we were all, you know, around the campfire and we had like, uh, cooked some, you know, some good food. We used to always like take, you know, some really good food out there with us and stuff. And I won't lie to you, you know, we were drinking beer and stuff. And, um, so we were, we were all around the campfire and we were just having a good time and telling jokes and laughing and whatnot. And it started drizzling. So, um, when it started drizzling, some of the girls and some of the guys are like, Oh, you know, I'm going to go get back in the tent. And so they went and got in their tents. Well, some of us stayed out there and, um, Cause it wasn't, you know, it wasn't raining like where you were soaked. It was just drizzling. So it was kind of like a cold drizzle. And so, um, we're out there and, you know, we're just waiting to see if it's going to get heavier or whatnot. And, uh, all of a sudden Wes, uh, just beyond the hayfield where there was this oak hammock behind it, uh, that was probably about a 20, 25 acre oak hammock that was on this ranch. Um, uh, all of a sudden we heard a roar that just reverberated through your body. That's the only way I know how to describe it. I mean, it, it reminded me of that roar that you hear in the King Kong movie, the old King Kong movie where he, where he fights the, uh, snake. Oh, kills yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was that kind of roar. I know that sounds silly, but. That's the only way I know to describe it. I mean, I didn't know of any animal that could make a sound like that, and let alone that powerful of a sound. So when that happened, I mean, we literally just froze. We all just froze and looked at each other. And uh, the guys and girls that were in the tents, they started coming out of the tents, and they're, oh, my God, what was that, you know? Well... Me and two of my buddies, um, we were kind of like the, I guess, the spear as far as like the wilderness guys and stuff. So uh, I had I had the only gun that we had on us in the whole campsite. I had a rifle, and it was a thirty thirty. And um, so me and two of my buddies, we decided we were going to go investigate. So there was this old cattle trail that kind of went alongside our campsite and kind of veered around and went around the uh, uh, cut, clear-cut hayfield and then went back to that hammock in the back. So we started walking down this cattle trail, and we had one of those old flashlights that you put like eight batteries in, the D batteries. And you always had to knock them around because <laughs> they would go out on you and you kind of bang them on your leg and then they'd come on again. Yeah, I remember. So yeah. <laughs> my buddy was holding it and he was shaking so bad. I mean, Wes, we were like huddled up, like, you know, kind of like you are in football in a huddle, but there are only three of us. We are kind of huddled up and they're kind of like walking, literally touching me in my back. And so I got the weapon and my buddy's trying to shine the flashlight, but he's shaking so bad. The beam is going everywhere. And I'm like, man, I'm like, shine that thing right. Or I said, you, you're going to get us killed. <laughs> Cause I, I, I'm not going to lie to you, Wes. I was scared. So, uh, long story short, you know, finally I just got the flashlight from him and, I was shining it real slow, like scanning it across the property. And I had my rifle in, in my other hand facing down. And as I was scanning across the property, <laughs> you'll laugh about this, but the, uh, the truck that was the flatbed that had the hay bales on it, it had those big chrome mirrors, you know, that stick way out. Well, I hit the chrome mirror with the uh, with the flashlight, and it reflected back, and it scared the you know what out of us. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, 
so then once I, I mean, once I got over being scared for, for a few seconds there, I realized what it was and we kind of chuckled a little bit, you know, one of those nervous laughs. And so we started approaching the, the area and the, the truck was over in that, in that quadrant of the clear cut hayfield. And, um, when we got it, got over towards the truck, uh, and we noticed this big, huge Texas uh, roll of hay that was, you know, just laying there. And it, and it was, what was crazy about it was probably, you know, I'm going to guesstimate about 15 feet from the actual flatbed truck. But as I was looking around, and because they were on the truck that day before it got dark, they were on the truck. And we were making quite a bit of noise around the camp. So, so I asked if, you know, later on after the incident, I asked if anybody, had ever, you know, if they'd heard anything other than the roar. And, and they all said no. Well, anyway, so the hay bell, come to find out when we were shining, well, I was shining the flashlight around it. It had like a bunch of mud splashed on one of the corners, one of the sides of it. And so I started investigating and you could see where something threw this hay, hay bell and it bounced. You could see like a big indentation, like maybe 10 feet away from it or maybe seven feet away from it between the truck and the hay bell where it literally bounced off of the ground. And because it was a little wet, you could see like this big indentation. And I guess the mud splashed up on it or whatever. And I'm thinking, my God, what could do that, you know? So, of course, we're pretty terrified, you know? And then we look around, and um, you could see where it kind of just, I don't i don't think it really threw the other hay bells off, but it kind of just rolled them off because they were all, like, around the truck kind of. So, anyway, that that creeped us out. So, we went back to the camp. And on the way, I told my buddies, I was like, just, they're going to all ask us what, you know, what we found or whatever. Just say that we, you know, we didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. And that way nobody panics. So that's exactly what we did. We followed through with that plan and we got back in the campsite. And everybody, of course, is asking us all these questions. And, um... I was trying to calm everybody down, you know, so um, we all end up staying in camp that night. And in the morning, um, I had I forgot to tell you one thing I left out, Wes, what I think caused the roar. And this is very important. And, and I'm just speculating. You know more about this than I do. But what I think caused the roar is remember I told you it was drizzling real bad. Yeah. When it when it stopped dri- while it was drizzling, it started putting out the fire, you know. So it it finally stopped drizzling, and when it did, um, the the fire was still barely going. So I got some gasoline. And I threw it on the fire. You know, I did it safely, but I put I poured it like in a big uh, like a, a Slurpee cup or something, and then I threw it on the fire. Um, and then it just, it went like a fire does. It probably went about 15 feet in the air. And so when it did that is when that thing roared, that that's something I left out. And I think that's important. So I don't know if that startled it, made it mad. I'm not sure what happened, but when that fire blazed up is when we heard that roar. And I, I thought that was important to make sure I add in there. Yeah, and I appreciate you adding that. And you know, the before we get back to when you went back to camp, uh, the bales yeah. of hay that you're talking about, you're not talking about a bale of hay. You're talking about the big circular uh, ones that they dig up, and those things are like 800 pounds, thousand pounds. Uh, for, yeah, for it to be pushed off that truck or more, they probably could weigh more than that. But for that to be pushed off the truck, I mean, it, normally it takes equipment to get those things off trucks. You know, you don't just push them off trucks. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's what I was thinking, Wes. You're exactly right. I was like, what 
<laughs> what could get in that one was you could tell it had been literally thrown off of that truck. I mean, I was thinking to myself, like, what could possibly do that? And you try to reason, you try to, you know, think of something, but there, there was nothing, no explanation in my mind. I just couldn't think of anything. All I could think of is, again, that, that you know, flashback that it had to have been some kind of monster or something, you know. Um, but anyway, getting back to uh, the camp. So we all get in camp, and um, I kind of stayed out by the fire all night after that. It was a real uh, chilly, crisp November night. It was probably, I'm going to say it was in the mid forties that night, if I had to guess. Um, so anyway, it was pretty chilly and I kind of had like a blanket and there were a few of us, we were kind of all huddled around the fire with that blanket and stuff, you know, cause some, some people just couldn't go back to sleep, you know? So the ones that couldn't go back to sleep, we just kind of hung out by the fire and I, and I was clutched to my rifle. I mean, I was, I was in a ready position, you know what I mean? So uh, the next morning, we kind of had this makeshift outhouse uh, by our camp, and um, one of the girls, she had gotten up to, to uh, go to the, the bathroom, and um, she, uh, I, I had actually gotten up by, from the fire, and I was kind of just walking around the camp and picking stuff up, you know, like cans and stuff like that, and trying to keep it nice and clean. And so um, when I was doing that, she came up to me and she's like, hey, Fox. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, um, her name's Ramona. And and she said, uh, she, she said, uh, I got to show you something. And she was kind of whispering to me, you know. So I'm thinking, man, she must have saw something or heard something. So I go with her and we go over by this makeshift outhouse that we had. And there was an impression by it. Now, now I don't want to make it sound like it was some great impression, you know, like a giant footprint. You could just tell where something big had actually stepped there. And because I knew a little bit about tracking, I knew it wasn't like some local animal. I mean, this thing was huge. I'd say it was probably anywhere between 16 and 17 inches long, if I had to guess. So... And maybe about five to six inches wide, maybe maybe about six inches wide. So anyways, um, so I started looking at it and I got down on my hands and knees and I was just like crawling around seeing if I could find any others. And she was looking around too. And we literally found those same tracks all the way around our campsite. So the either it did it before we got there or it did it that night that we were there. But this creature had walked all the way around our campsite and it was a pretty good size, like circle campsite, you know, where we cleared it out. We cleared all the brush and made it real smooth and everything. So it was a pretty good size campsite and this thing had walked all the way around us. So my question to you, because you're a lot more experienced than me, um, do you think possibly that this creature, which I, I believe was a Sasquatch, do you think that it may have actually later on that night, like, you know, came around our camp and was watching us? Yeah, that's hard to say. I mean, I'd be speculating on my end if I said yes or no. Um, you know, my opinion of it is generally their behavior, they do that they'll come and they'll circle around a campsite. Um, sometimes they won't make their presence known. Most of the time they will, uh, cause they want you to leave. Uh, but sometimes they won't make their presence known. Uh, I remember when I was in Texas and, uh, we were at the, we were camping out in this area and it's pretty well known for activity and everything like that, but we didn't hear anything that night. And the next morning we got up and kind of walked around the campsite, kind of walked around the outer boundary of the campsite. And you could tell where something walked up, sat down, and and it was a perfect spot to sit there and watch us. I mean, if wow. I sat there and there was people camping there, they would never know I was there. And I could sit there and watch them all night. 
And um, so it does fit their beer as far as kind of uh, walking around a campsite or checking things out. Um, you may have thrown it off by throwing gasoline on the fire and it set, you know, might've been closer than you realized. And it, you know, probably shocked it. So it roared or screamed at you guys. I guess long, long answer is it probably walked around that night without you guys realizing it. But again, that's me speculating. You know what I mean? And, and yeah, but I mean, it sounds like a very good explanation and one that is very logical. Do you, do you um, I mean, are, this is probably a dumb question, but I mean, are they really that stealth? Like, can they get something that huge get that close to you and you not even know it? Yeah, you know I, mean, I mean, you hear that all the time with eyewitnesses, that they never heard it come in. Um, most of the eyewitnesses, if you hear encounters with hunters or uh, hikers or anything else, uh, they never hear it come in. You know, and they'll have wow. some sort of face-to-face -face encounter with it, and then they part ways. Well, when it leaves, uh, it makes quite the noise when it leaves. It'll knock branches off. It'll tear things up as it leaves. But I've heard a lot of uh, encounters where people... Uh, say I never even knew it was there. Just it was just there, you know. And I don't know how it strolled into camp without anyone noticing. And a lot of times in those camping areas too, uh, there's a lot of foliage on the ground. There's a lot of branches on the ground, you know, around a campsite. And so mm -hmm. if you walk into a campsite, everyone's going to hear you, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. within 500 yards. Everyone's going to know you're there. And these things do kind of stroll in without being heard. So, yeah, it doesn't shock me one bit. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, just, just my just my um, observation, I'm sure that they're a lot more adapted to um, not being seen than, than, say, your very best Native American that's out in the wilderness or your mountain man that's trying to be, you know, quiet or whatnot, you know, when you're stalking or something. I mean, I'm sure they... They're a whole lot better at than us, you know. Could be, could be. Um, I don't know. I've met some Native American trackers, man, and you would never know they were there. Uh, they're like ghosts. <laughs> they come in and they leave, and you'd never know they were there. Uh, but these things tend to do that too as well. Um, after this encounter, and kind of looking at this over the years, what what do you think that uh, Sasquatch is, Fox? What's kind of your opinion? I mean, personally, I, I think that, you know, like, if you really, like, you know, study, you know, um, the, the Bible, like the King James Bible, you'll see, you know, because that's, that's probably the closest thing we have to the Dead Sea Scrolls. But you'll see that, um, you know, God, he, he, well, let's just keep it simple. He's the great creator, so... I think it's very small minded for us to think that he stopped creating with us. You know, I've always believed that. And, and you look at the billions of planets and, and, and the galaxies beyond and to think that we're the only life forms. I mean, I, I just think that's very arrogant for us to believe that. Um, and we also know that there were parts of the, of the original, scrolls that were taken from the text so you know there's there's i'm sure a lot of things that we don't know about and um i would have to say that there's some kind of descendant you know and i think that uh some of them are related more in the animal kingdom but i believe some of them are of a higher intelligence and, and perhaps um some kind of distant relative you know to us um, and, and I believe there's also different species, just like in in humans, you, you have a lot of differences in, in you know, in the human race uh, as far as looks and uh, even in the animal kingdom, you know, with similar species that, that also can vary in their looks and their, uh, you know, different um, qualities. So that that's just my belief. Um now, you were talking about the Native Americans. One of the coolest things I ever saw, uh, I actually saw a fully dressed Native American when I was bow hunting one year, and he had his younger son with him, and they were fully dressed. And um, 
they were stalking through the woods. He was literally teaching his son how to stalk. And, and I didn't even hear him. I mean, they came right up under my stand before I saw them. I never heard them the whole time. So you're absolutely right about that. I mean, they're, they're probably the very best there is when it comes to that. Um, do you mind if I uh, tell my other encounters? And Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So um, in that same area where I saw the Native Americans, um, I had been hunting and there was this big laid over pine tree. It was probably about maybe 10 feet off the ground. And I had gotten up on it and I was using it as a, as a deer stand. And I was hunting in a lower bottom near the Suwannee river. There was a swamp in there. So I was hunting down there and, um, I was waiting for a deer to come down this trail and, and, you know, get some water or whatnot. And all of a sudden these two hogs came in and, you know, hogs, they make a lot of noise, of course. So I'm watching and I'm waiting. And the first one that came in is the first one that I've ever encountered my whole life here in Florida was a white piney wood root or boar. So it was a male and he probably weighed well over 300 pounds, maybe closer to 350 had huge tusk out to the side and he was in front. And then there was a black one that was smaller behind him. So I had my 30 out six and, um, I was only literally about maybe 45 yards away and I, I didn't have a scope or anything, but I put one right through the white one, right through the front shoulder. And when I hit him, he squealed and he just dropped like a rock. And he wasn't moving or anything. So then the second one just kind of like was stunned, I guess. And so I popped the second one. Well, when I popped the second one, it ran into the swamp. So I started going after it because I was going to, you know, go ahead and put it down. So I spent probably only literally about maybe 15 minutes. And then I got where it started getting deeper and I, was, I couldn't do it. I couldn't go any further. So, okay, well, I hate to, you know, wound the hog, but I can come up there and try to track it. So long story short, I went back to the first one I shot and it was gone. 350 pound boar gone. I mean, it just was gone. And, and so I started looking all over I started looking for blood and everything. I didn't see but a couple of drops of blood. And so my party that was with me, which was one of my best friends and his father, they came up like maybe about 20 minutes in and they, they said, we heard a shot. And so I told them, you know, and I said, yeah, I shot two hogs. And I said, but one of them went into the swamp wounded. I couldn't go any further. I said, but I came back to get the first one I shot that wasn't moving. I mean, it was down. And I, and I even looked at it. I looked at it for a couple of seconds right before I chased that one in the swamp. Like, as I was kind of running by, I looked at it real good. And I could see that I put a good hit on it. So I told him, I said, it's gone. And, and his dad said, well, what do you mean gone? And I said, I don't know. I said, this thing wasn't moving. I put a good hit on it. And now it's gone. So, Wes, we looked probably for about four or five hours into the night looking for that hog, looking for any sign. And I'm telling you, we couldn't find any trace of that hog. So, and, and there were no footprints around or anything. But, I mean, this 350-pound hog was just gone. Yeah. So, how do you explain that? Yeah, very strange. And, and I mean, I've shot different animals and, you know, you know, when you put a good hit on an animal and when it goes down right away and doesn't move, it's usually, you know, it's usually dead or dying, but this thing was just gone. And, and there was, you know, if it, if it would have, if it would have gotten up itself or something, there would have been a lot of disturbance right there because th this was a game trail that these hogs came down so there would have been a lot of disturbance there. There was no disturbance at all, Wes. 
It's like something just picked it up and it just vanished. We ended up finding the other hog the next day. Um, and it was still actually a little bit alive. So we had to put it down, but we never found that white boar. Never. I mean, it's a white boar. You would think, you know, it would be easy to find it. You know what I mean? But, but we couldn't yeah. find it. Um, yeah, very strange. So that, you hear a lot of hunters talk about that where they, they'll shoot elk, you know, and the elk here in Washington state are, you know, the size of horses and, or bigger and they'll shoot them and they'll, they go to get the animal and the animal's gone. It's like it just vanished and no one yeah. really has an answer for it, you know? So yeah, that is bizarre. Was that the only time something like that ever happened to you? Honestly, that's the only time anything bizarre like that ever happened. Um, usually when I would shoot something, I would always shoot it, you know, with a good shot and kill it. And I never had anything get back up on me and take off. I mean, that one hog did, but we got it the next day. Um, I, I never, you know, shot something where I wounded it and wasn't able to retrieve it or find it. So that that was very bizarre. Now, I, I don't know what happened, so I can only speculate. But I'm just saying, in my mind, as someone that spent a lot of time hunting all my life, I I don't understand. I can't explain it. You know, what I mean, there's no logical explanation for it, in, in my opinion. So yeah. Anyway, I just I, I just wanted to tell you about that because that was very bizarre. And then lastly, I just wanted to share my cousin's encounter with you um, to give you a little bit of the backstory. Uh, and I won't use his name because he is very. I mean he doesn't talk about it to anyone and, and it spooked him so bad that he quit hunting and everything because of it. But anyways, so, um, my cousin and I, you know, we're like brothers and he's the same way he's been hunting and fishing and, you know, camping and hiking in the wilderness all his life. And so, um, we both are at, we, well, he was an avid bow hunter and, and I bow hunt. So, um, you know, I kept asking him to go bow hunting and he kept, you know, coming up with different excuses and stuff. And this went on for years. Right. So I'm thinking, what, what is going on here? I mean, why is he being this way? There's something more to it. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a jerk and pressure him or anything. You know, you don't want to try to force somebody to do something. So I would just kindly ask him every, you know, every now and then, Hey, you ready to, you ready to go bow hunting this year? And I got a good lease. I said, you know, we should do real well out there, but he just almost like he, he just did not want to go no matter what. So one Thanksgiving, I said, Hey, uh, you're going to go bow hunting with me this year. <laughs> so much for, for being gentle. Right. So I said, you're going to go bow hunting with me this year. And he's like, nah, I, I, I really can't. I'm, I'm busy. I got a lot of, I'm like, you got to go. He's like, listen, he goes, I got rid of my bow. I don't even have a bow. And I said, well, you do now. So I gave him one of my old bows, which was actually a really nice bow. And I finally convinced him to go. So we had to drive a pretty good ways to where I had this lease. And uh, long story short, on the way there, um, I'm like, can you tell me what's going on, man? I'm like, that's not like you not to want to go hunting. And uh, he's like, he goes, I really don't want to talk about it. I'm like, you got to talk about it, man. You can't just keep that in you. You got to tell me at least. And uh so he said, I'll tell you what he said, uh, I'll tell you later on at camp. So we got there, it was still daylight. We set up camp and everything. Um, I got a fire going, you know, and we were sitting around there and we were uh, grilling some steaks and drinking a beer. And uh, I said, okay. I said, you ready to tell me? So he was scared to death telling me this story. His, his voice was shaking the whole time. He was, he was shaking visibly. 
I mean, I never saw him like that ever. And he proceeded to tell me this story. So he and uh, three of his buddies decided they were going to go bow hunting in Stina Hatchie. So Stina Hatchie, um, in case you're not familiar with it, is a lot of wilderness area. And it's also well known for a lot of the Vietnam veterans. I say a lot, but a few of the Vietnam veterans that actually, um, you know, after the war, they actually went out there and, and lived. So you hear a lot of strange stories um, involving this this land. So he and his buddies were out there and um, they were bow hunting and they had a plan, you know, where each one of them were going to go and whatnot. So my cousin, um, he uses a tree climber like I do, and he had climbed about 20 feet up of this pine tree and he was hunting an, an off game trail, you know, not, not one of the major game trails, but one that was one of the offshoots. So he, he uh, knew that there were some good sign, you know, he'd found some scrapes and rubs and stuff. So he was just pretty sure that he was going to get him a nice buck. So he got out there um, late. He got out there around 1130 that morning, he told me. Because for some reason they didn't get up early like they like they had planned, so he ended up doing a day hunt. You know where you get you get in the woods and you end up staying all day in your stand. I'm sure you've done that, Wes. He was in his stand and he was facing the uh, the off game trail, and as he as he was looking down the off game trail, he said it. He said it was probably about. Um, um, it, I, I think he told me it was in February, February or something. No, I'm sorry. It was September cause it was both season. I messed up. So it was like in September and he's, he's got his bow, you know, and he's looking down this off game trail. Well, he said he saw something kind of like peeking out from the trail, but, but towards the back, like where it was more shady. He he's watching it because he's thinking it's a buck or something, you know. And he, you know how the bucks will they'll just like slowly peek out off of a trail, and then they'll just tiptoe out and just yeah. go across real quietly. Yeah. Well, that that's what he thought he was seeing. He thought he was seeing a buck that was being just real skittish and just easing out slowly. Well, he said that it was about probably, you know, maybe four, four and a half feet off the ground. So he's thinking, you know, that's a buck that he's sticking his head out and he's watching this thing. And then he realizes that it's not a buck. And he, and he starts thinking, whoa, is, is that a bear? So he's looking at it and he's kind of straining to see it and everything. And he said that all of a sudden this thing starts raising up and he said that it stood all the way up and it was sideways to him. And he said, this thing was massive. Now he says that it was probably around eight and a half to nine feet tall. But he said he can't be sure, but that's what he estimated because he he never went back there later to measure or anything. I mean, this the, when you hear the rest of the story, you'll you'll understand. I mean, it, it just spooked him so bad. He didn't even want to go in the woods ever again after that. So he said this thing stood all the way up. And I want to say something real quick. I've never known my cousin to lie. The whole time I've known him, I've, I've known him to BS like we all do, but he'll let you know that he's BSing later or, or during that time. But I've never known him to outright lie about anything. So he said this thing stood up, and he's, he's thinking, man, that is a huge bear. So then it ends up turning towards him and starts walking down the path. 
And he said he didn't hear a sound. This thing's walking down the path. And when he first saw it, I forgot to mention, he said it was probably about 45 yards away. That's what he told me. He said it was probably about 45 yards away when he first saw it. So this thing starts walking down the path. And where he is, it opens up from this pathway. It opens up, or path rather, it opens up and then he's facing towards this path. So he's in a pine hammock. So anyways, um, it walks up to the edge of, of the open, up, you know, where it opens up. And it is literally facing him. And he said, till this day, he doesn't know how because he was 20 feet up in the air. This thing all of a sudden slowly looks right up at him. It literally knew he was up there. And it looked right at him. And he, he said he wasn't making any noise. He was so scared that he was just scared to death. He was trying to be so quiet because he was hoping to God that this thing didn't see him. And it looked right up at him. And then he said, he didn't know how much time went by, but he said that all of a sudden this thing just started swaying back and forth real slow just swaying back and forth, looking up at him and just, you know, staring him dead in the eyes. Like it, it wasn't no mistaken that it was looking right at him. And then he said that it kind of like lifted its head and sniffed real loud, like a snorting sound. And then he said that it stared at him and kind of opened its mouth a little bit. Cause he remembers the teeth were not like fangs. They were like human teeth. And he said it had a huge mouth. He said it didn't like roar or any of that. It just, it just, you know, made like a snorting sound, like it was sniffing him or something. And then he said it kind of opened its mouth and looked a little bit angry. He said it didn't look like it was, you know, you know, going to kill him or anything. But he said it looked like it was upset or something all of a sudden. And it just stared at him for maybe another minute or two. And he was just frozen. He he couldn't even move, he said. And he peed his pants and everything. And and he said finally this thing just slowly turned around. Like his he said the the um upper body turned first and it was still looking at him and as it slowly turned around it slowly like his head and its upper body just turned and then he said he remembers it was so weird because it was almost like it was double jointed, like the whole upper body turned and, and started facing the path. And then the, the lower body just followed with it. And it walked all the way down back in the path to where he couldn't see it anymore. And, and it scared him so bad, Wes, that he could not physically even come down from the tree. He, he could not even physically bring himself to come down from the tree. So his buddies, because they knew the general area that he was going to be in, they were searching for him in the night and they finally found him up in that tree. And he was terrified. They literally had to go up in the tree and, and bring him down. They had to go up there and actually bring my cousin down. And <laughs> Even just telling this story, you could see the fear in him. And and I can't even imagine. I mean, I know you and Woody can because y'all's encounter was just off the rails. But I can't even imagine how incredibly, you know, scary that had to have been for him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he, he won't even talk about it. He, he won't. He doesn't want to go hunting. I mean. Yeah. And, and to make it worse, when we went, and this I thought was strange too, when we went hunting, we were coming back and it was it was already starting to get dark. This was the next uh, evening, rather. So when we were coming back, Wes, either it was poachers or something very strange. We were coming back. We were about a mile from camp, and we're and we're coming through the wilderness, and we're going back to to the truck. And 
as we're coming out of the wilderness, we were probably about 200 yards from the truck. Some, some, some poachers or something surrounded us and they were making all kind of weird animal noises around us. Like one would be a bird, another one would be an owl. It, it was all the way around us. And it, and it lasted until we got about probably 50 yards from the truck and then it stopped. They, you could tell they had us surrounded, whatever it was. And so, so he was, he was okay all through the hunt and everything. I'm not going to say he wasn't scared. I'm sure he was, but he was okay to go on this hunt. But when that happened to us, Wes, he doesn't go in the woods at all anymore. That, that freaked him out so bad. And I, and I said, I said, I won't say his name, but I, I said, man, I, I'm pretty sure it was poachers, man, because they have a bad uh, – that that area is bad for poachers where we were. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure it was poachers. He goes, man, that wasn't poachers. He goes, I know you're trying to make me feel better, but that, that wasn't poachers. You know it and I know it. I said, honestly, I don't know that it wasn't, but I, I tell you something, I've never had that happen to me ever in in the wilderness. So I thought that was real freaky myself. And I wouldn't think it'd be poachers though. You know, poachers try and stay on the down low. And when you come across other hunters, a lot of poachers will avoid you at all costs. Um, yeah, but you know, maybe you were saying it to make him feel better. Uh, it is bizarre. It's a very bizarre encounter. Uh, and you hear these things making animal noises, um, it's too bad that he won't go back out there. I hate to hear, uh, cause I know what it feels like, you know, the, the woods are supposed to be some place where you go to clear your mind, some place of peace, some place of, um, you know, and when that gets taken away from you, it, it sucks. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear your, your cousins went through, your cousin went through it and it, and his encounter is terrifying, man. I've had so many people up in tree stands and they'll say very similar things to what your cousin said, to where they're like a statue, they're not moving, and these creatures will automatically like pinpoint where they're at and look right at them. Uh, but thank God it it you know it walked off. And um, but I appreciate you sharing that, Fox, and I appreciate you sharing all of your encounters. Um, tell us a little, before we close out, tell us a little bit about your business. I know it's called Wild Wild Pest in. Uh, Florida, kind of tell us what you do and tell us a little bit about it for anyone in Florida. Okay, sure. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. And then thank you for the uh, compliments. I want to return them back to you. And I really meant what I said, Wes. I mean, I'm not blowing smoke. I'm telling you from my heart. Uh, not only did you help me to have the desire to want to get back out in the outdoors again and, and really help with my um, healing, you know, to, to just, it was so therapeutic, you know, and, um, I, I want to thank you for that most of all. And, and, you know, I really meant it when I said you touch so many lives and I know the Bigfoot community can be very critical and, and, and bash, you know, the people that are really trying to do some good, but I believe with all my heart, you're one of the good ones. I, I really believe that, not only is yours and Woody's account encounter true, because I, I was in law enforcement. I've interrogated hundreds of people. I pretty much know when somebody's lying. And not only do I believe you all about that, but um, I just know that, um, you know, you're, you're just a really good hearted guy. And, you know, you really help so many people, including myself and, uh, you know, I hope I know it's hard sometimes to take compliments. I know you're humble, uh, but I really hope you take that to heart because I really believe that's why you do what you do. So for all those critics out there that, um, you know, give you a hard time and whatnot, uh, they need to find something else better to do. You know what I mean? Because if you're not helping, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. And, you know, we, we, we need to come together as a community and support one another. Um, so, so for me, um, you know, I, I've been trapping since I was a kid because we had a lot of livestock and we had a lot of predators that would try to get them. 
Um, and so I, I started trapping when I was very, very uh, young. My, my grandfather, uh, and he, he taught me, you know, about trapping and whatnot. So anyways, um, I, I enjoyed it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I never have been one to consider myself as an expert or anything, but, um, I have a real passion for it. I love helping the animals. And so I started a company once I finally got better from my accident. Um, and I recovered, you know, from, from my brain trauma and everything. I started a company called Wild Wild Pest here in Florida. And I'm in Pinellas and Hillsborough County mainly. It's just a family-owned small wildlife company. And what I do is I manage uh, wildlife for people, any kind of wildlife problems they might have. And also uh, I do captures, live captures. And I work a lot with FWC and they help promote me and stuff, you know. But I don't really advertise. Um, I've tried it before, and I just really can't afford to do much of it. So I appreciate the opportunity for you to let me uh, tell folks about it. And um, I handle, you know, everything from snakes to uh, squirrels, to raccoons, possums, uh, any, any kind of wildlife, uh, coyotes, uh, and even, uh, cats and, and whatnot. So it's something I really enjoy. Um, and it, and it's really, uh, uh, you know, helped me to be able to save a lot of animals. And then I have a GoFundMe page, which is wild, wild pest, uh, wild, wild, uh, wild animals need saving too. And so if, if uh, any listeners want to go there and, and read my uh, story and my cause, I would very much appreciate it. Um, I'm not begging for money. I don't believe in that. But if you, you know, have the, the amount for a cup of coffee or something, you want to give a donation, that'd be great. Um, but, Wes, I just want to say again, it's been a great honor to be on your show. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, my son Bear is a big fan as well, and um, he's the one that encouraged me to tell my encounters because um, I never really talked about them, but to maybe two people before. Um, so I really appreciate it, Wes, and uh, and I uh, really appreciate you and all all that you do for everybody. Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words. The honor is mine having you on. Do you have a website for Wild Web Pest? Well, you're going to laugh. I had a website, and I'm getting ready to put up another one, but um, it got hacked, and so it was all in, in like, Chinese. <laughs> so I couldn't even go on there and fix it or anything. But I do have a Facebook. Uh, you'll see that. And uh, my phone number, if you don't mind me giving it out real quick, no, go ahead. is area code 727-483-2126. 727-483-2126. And I'm very reasonable. I'm, my prices are lower than anybody else's, and I pride myself on on taking care of the people. You know, I really do care. So thank you so much, Wes. I really mean that. And um, I, I hope that uh, we can stay in touch. And um, I just thank you so much for being the inspiration that you are. Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words. Tell your son hello for me. Uh, if you're out there in Florida, definitely look up Wild Wild Pest with uh, flo with flocks with uh, <laughs> <laughs> with fox. And I wish you were out here in, in Washington State, man. I there's a raccoon. Every time I take the trash out, he's always out there. And I swear to God, he's the size of a Sasquatch. And he just <laughs> he he doesn't really give me any trouble, but he gives me the stink eye. And I just look at him and kind of nod and put the trash away and then I go inside, you know, I, that's a battle I don't want. You know, I, I outweigh him, I outsize him, but I have this uh, sneaky suspicion he'd probably uh, mop the floor with me if we got into it. So, uh, <laughs> you and I are both, you and I are both past bouncers too, which is pretty cool. And, you know, I can tell you right now, uh, sometimes these animals get the best of me too. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was doing an otter job. I was doing an otter job, uh, and I do a lot of my stuff at nighttime, you know, and do it in the stealth of the night. And so I was doing an otter job around a lake not too long ago, 
and uh, and I got too close to the bank and it caved in on me and I fell right in the water. <laughs> And I had I had an otter swimming around me, and and you know otters can be very vicious. And if he knew that I was trying to trap him, he might have really tried to have a go at me. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I, you know it sounds silly, but that's what I was thinking. I'm like, this otter knows that I've been trying to trap it, and now he's going to get me. You know. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. Like I said, raccoons really aren't that big. You shouldn't be afraid of them. But I I got this weird feeling if he and if him and I got into it. He'd mop the floor with me. Um, and he eats everything. He's like this grossly obese raccoon that just seems to kind of run the neighborhood. You know, most dogs won't mess with them. Cats won't mess with them. And he's, he's got the, uh, he runs, he runs a show out here, but I appreciate all of the, uh, kind words, Fox. And thank you again for coming on. Absolutely. Wes. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Fox. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.